Hi, I'm Stuart and welcome to our podcast, The More You Know. Our podcast will be looking into how the manufacture of semiconductors interacts with our everyday life. Welcome to our podcast, The More You Know. Today's podcast is all about carbon capture and particularly shining a light on bio or, as I should say, and hopefully my guests will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, nature-based carbon capture. I'm delighted to say, once again, we have a very special guest in Chris Jones, Henry Rossiter and Gail Martin from Belmont Estates. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Could um, perhaps you give us a little bit of an insight into your roles at Belmont Estate and what Belmont Estate is? Gil? Uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Gil Martin. I manage the Belmont Estate and I run all the activities that take place on the estate and they range from uh, nature recovery through to corporate partnerships, through to connecting the community and people back with nature, with food and with where it comes from. The Belmont Estates are where? Uh, so we're just outside of Bristol. Okay. Um, we are uh, wild and green and yet only a stone's throw from the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Ah, right. And uh, Henry, what do, what do you do? Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, so my name is Henry Rossiter uh, and I am the Business Development Director for Belmont Estates. So uh, like Gil, I share responsibility um, for corporate partnerships at Belmont, um, but I also uh, cover all things such as events uh, and also food production and, and ensuring that it's supplied into the local area and, uh, and local restaurants. Also joining us on the panel today is Dr. Chris Jones, um, also known as Chris Jones. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm the Environmental Solutions Business Development Manager for Edwards. So my role is to better understand uh, our industries and societies' sustainability goals and then transfer those through to our business as a whole. So, Chris, carbon capture. Could, I know we've talked about this before, but just for any newcomers to our fabulous podcast, and we've got very special guests, and could you give us just a bit of background on general carbon capture, storage and utilisation? Society, we emit about 50 gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent every year. And that result of that is a gradual increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. About 76% of the carbon equivalent comes from carbon dioxide. A lot of it comes from energy, but some of it from transport, some of it indeed from agriculture and forestry. But the, uh, the idea is that as the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere goes up, so, uh, the, uh, so the climate warms and we're trying to target at one and a half degrees C. Uh, I think that might be quite a struggle. That's what we're trying to. That's what we're trying to target. Um, if, as we're emitting, we can all look to reduce our emissions. Uh, so, one of the technologies that's been employed is uh, the capture of carbon dioxide. Two generic approaches. Uh, one of which is at point of release, uh, and the other of which is a uh, direct from atmosphere. And then there's a, a wide range of technologies. That yeah, I've spent a lot of time researching this up. We could go on forever yes, looking at all the different things. Gil, am I using the right terminology? One of the things we like to do on the podcast, is it bio carbon capture or nature carbon capture? What's the best terminology? Are they both the same thing? No, so for us, it's, it's definitely nature-based solutions. It, it's broader as a subject than carbon but mm -hmm. for the purposes of this conversation focusing in on carbon what we are interested in and we are uh, delivering on a site uh, that we own is nature-based solutions delivering actually uh, both sequestering carbon drawing carbon down atmospheric carbon through perhaps tree growth or or other mechanisms and also carbon abatement which is to stop the release of carbon from a degraded uh, land mass or, or um, a badly managed land, peatland restoration or degraded peatland being one of the key examples. Because we're both in the abatement business then, mm -hmm. the, uh, with our abatement in the semiconductor industry and your abatement in nature. You just alluded to earlier on as well, it's more than just carbon capture. Could you give us a little bit of insight? And in, you said you were a conservationist because mm. I asked you earlier, are you a scientist? And you went... <laughs> No, I'm a conservationist. Yes. Like there. I mean, know what we think of scientists with Dr. Jones sitting here. <laughs> Very knowledgeable. But, um, um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, and I'm probably a number of things or none of any of these things, mm -hmm. but I could be a conservationist, I could be a farmer, I could be a land manager mm -hmm. or, or a businessman. And, um, and I'd perhaps try and be all of those things. But one of the dangers that we're trying to avoid at Belmont is to oversimplify the, the issue mm -hmm. and oversimplify the solution to the issue. So... Um, 
climate change being driven by greenhouse gas emissions, that, that's a reality. That's not something that's coming down the line. That's something we're experiencing yeah. now. But it is intrinsically interlinked with a series of other issues. The principal one that, that really resonates with us is biodiversity decline. And so they are one and the same issue uh, connected uh, but distinct in different ways mm. and if you ignore one whilst trying to tackle the other with an over overly binary uh, approach then all we will do is is tackle one crisis whilst ignoring one emergency and so they are they are completely interlinked so nature-based solutions help us tackle multiple issues at the same mm. time so for example um uh, wetland habitats in the UK and actually further afield are one of our fastest disappearing habitats. They're home to a, a vast array of species that have spent millennia evolving uh, evolutionary niches and life cycles suited to a, an ephemeral wetland habitat, which is no longer there. We've lost 97% of our wetland habitats. Um, and when we say lost, what we really mean is dried out. And so we're suffering this biodiversity decline through loss of habitat. The resulting or the leftover degraded habitat is peatland, which has been uh, sequestering carbon very slowly, but since the end of the last ice age, so they represent a huge carbon store. Mm. As they dry out, they emit carbon into the atmosphere. So by re-wetting them, we're able to tackle multiple issues, biodiversity decline and carbon capture being being two at the mm. same time, as a carbon abatement, to be precise. Mm. Uh, Henry, interestingly, you were talking about food production earlier on. Isn't a lot of the biodiversity loss due to our need to feed the population? Uh, vastly. So how do you balance that? It's, it's a really good question. It's an interesting one in the fact that, uh, so if we look at a, a conventional farming method, there's a roughly 10 to sometimes 18 applications of uh, herbicide, pesticide, uh, and additional nutrients that all go into uh, producing conventional wheat or barley or maize or any of the sort of the, the crops that we imagine. The issue with that is, as you've just said, it, uh, it does lead to a, a vast biodiversity decline. And that's uh, happened throughout the sort of, if you look at the data since the 70s, we've lost, uh, this is also additionally a, a badger issue, but we've lost 95% of all hedgehogs. Um, and biodiversity has continued to fall. We are, uh, according to the uh, RS... You're not saying we're going to have to eat hedgehogs, are you? Is that no, what you're saying? No, you no, no I was getting a bit worried. Oh, right, I see. You. I'm getting a bit worried there that we're going to eat hedgehogs. No, no, no. no. I don't fancy myself uh, against the badger either way. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's true. We are, so out of the, uh, all the countries and territories in the world, out of the 240, uh, England uh, is the seventh worst country. Uh, country for biodiversity, uh, for biodiversity. Uh, and Scotland isn't much better, they're at number 12. So as a, a nation, we are awful. Um, in terms of how do you balance it, it's a really, really good question because we are obsessed with uh, production and yield and getting as much uh, food from a particular patch of land that we mm -hmm. have in England. The issue is... is um, I suppose that must be the same everywhere, though, is, is it not, not just England? It'll be the same in all... Everyone wants food security in some way, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah very much so. And you, you, food is one of those things that if you don't have enough of it, water too, it creates war. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of war, it actually creates uh, quite a lot of shortages as well. We've, we've seen that perfect... Um, literally bombshell from uh, the Ukraine and Russia invasion mm. and how prices of everything have spiked. And no mm. one's quite sure, but climate change is also a thing that's starting to change. We've already seen that uh, tomato uh, production from Spain and Italy is vastly down uh, this year, which has led to price hikes. And so uh, it's a wonderful, uh, not single sort of approach that you mm. can do to uh, <clears throat> increase, well, not actually increase food production, but it's, we need to focus on waste. Uh, we waste a terrifying amount of food uh, personally mm. through supermarkets and supply chains and also at the farm. Um, but we need to look at the farming methods and there are uh, vast amounts of crop that are grown uh, to provide uh, heating sources that go into biomass or alternatively it's used as cattle feed, for example. And there are other ways to feed uh, animals and our homes with energy uh, than just growing a crop to then burn it. Mm. So uh, there isn't really an answer, more of a string of many answers that we need to look at our entire system to make a difference. Chris, do you think tech will help the answer? To hear so the challenges you've got in conservation and on um, food production. In order to perform an intervention, you need to understand uh, the system that you're intervening on. So uh, technology provides a method of measuring and monitoring, and it 
you can indeed start performing the appropriate interventions, as uh, Henry and Gill have just been detailing. You can uh, also uh, track other things. Yield, uh, as Henry has mentioned, is important. We're all very used to uh, cheap food. Is that necessarily the right position to be in? Yeah, cheap food is. What did somebody say the other day? I, I was a farmer. I, I get all my information from Country File, by the way. Okay, <laughs> so that's. Uh, but th there was an aspect of it. We have to stop making cheap food, but making food that is um, of value to us, because they were still saying it's a certain demographic that buy the cheap food and the richer people could buy. I think um, we used to spend, what, 30% of our family budget on food? Exactly. Mm. Um, now, what is it, 10%? 10.8%. Mm. Uh, right. um, but, um, mm. yeah, but it's you're right. And it's the obsession with cheap food has actually led to uh, more... Uh, nutritionally a devalued food so you know, when you look at the uh bread for example that white bread that you uh buy from a supermarket that is in a certain branded uh package um they are bleaching these uh these grains that they're using to make the flour so that you can take out or ideally take out these uh, pesticides and herbicides that are sprayed on them and you effectively by doing that you just remove all the nutritional value so for it to then meet uh, the food standards association uh, guidelines they have to artificially add more vitamins mm -hmm. in so the food that we're buying for this budget uh, isn't good for us uh, at all and we need to look at everything as a widespread so Gil what I'm getting from the two guys sitting either side of you is food's important but from your point of view, conservation is important. How do you balance? Do you have discussions with Henry going, I want to plant trees here? And he's going, no, I want to plant carrots here. How, how do you balance that out in the Belmont Estates? Or or because I'm taking it as a role model for other areas to look at. How do you balance the need for conservation and the, the, the aspect of, let's call it, you call it carbon abatement and the need for Henry to feed me? How do you balance that on the thing? Um, it's the perfect question, I think, because it gets to the complexity and the interconnectedness of the issue. So, uh, and we can uh, attend to all of our agendas with the same actions. So, if conventional farming consumes resources, releases carbon, uh, actually, there's a significant amount of, of carbon release that comes from agriculture. I think it's something like 10% in the UK, and it's more uh, taken on a global context. Um, then something like regenerative farming attempts to uh, to rejuvenate and restore and perhaps even uh, sequester some of that carbon. So what do you mean by sequester the carbon? So by promoting soil health, you will... Uh, so just like the peat uh, scenario I gave you earlier with the dried mm -hmm. landscape, if you are over-plowing, over-farming, you've lost your soil health and your soil structure, what you're suffering is soil loss through wind and through water and you're exposing the organic matter every time you plough. Mm -hmm. In that organic matter is sequestered carbon. Right. Um, and, and it's being uh, uh, lost through those, uh, though, by being opened up by the plough. Uh, on top of that, we have no, we're no longer farming a broad range of herbs. We, we farm a very narrow group of crops with quite shallow roots. And so what we end up with is soil, which is low on, on organic matter. So not only are we, are we releasing carbon uh, season by season by exposing the soil. We're also not really sequestering it at the same rate that mm -hmm. we used to, or those natural processes, pre-agricultural processes used to sequester. Um, and and the reason it's a, th th this is a nice microcosm for the whole issue is that the solutions probably all live in the same place. So it's not a question of choosing between nature or or climate action and, and carbon sequestration and conservation. The answer is all the same thing. So... Uh, the bigger question is rather than about the amount of food we produce is about ultimate food security. So as we, in the future, we, we're going to have some serious problems as our uh, natural systems retreat like pollinators are, are increasingly absent. There's a tremendous mm. decline in the number of pollinators. And yet... Can I just say, not in my garden. For some reason, we've got bees everywhere. So if you come out, you could take yeah, some fantastic. of them. I'll send okay, them over well, to the Belmont. I seem to have You're like wrong. 10 bees in my house. You're obviously the doing something right. But, but uh, if you recall your youth or when you first started driving or car journey in, your, uh, in yeah. your youth, the amount of insects mm -hmm. that used to get killed on your windscreen to the point where you had to put your windscreen washers on yeah. because they, they turn to concrete yeah, uh, yeah. if you're not careful. And, and sometimes you couldn't even read your number plate off after a long yeah. journey. And there's, uh, it's a very clear demonstration of the decline in those insects and ultimately pollinators that you can go a whole journey now without killing a single insect. And 
And so this isn't a question about yield, and it's not a question about food production versus nature. It's it's a question about can we understand that food production is just a natural process. It's reliant on everything from uh, predictable weather patterns to water storage in the soil to pollinators, in, and mm -hmm. by which I mean insects and yeah. bats and birds. Uh, and when they're absent, it won't be that we have a 10% reduction. It'll be that we have no food to consume. And so the... the Apart from the cheap stuff that we get, is so the, um, the cheap, what do you call it, the... Oh, I'm trying to think with the food. They were talking about it the other day, the cheap food, it's all kind of artificial additives and you yeah. know, we'll all be living off of like cheesy string. Highly processed. Yeah, yeah, the, that that yeah. was the one I was looking yeah. at, high, high processed food, yeah. And increasingly factory produced protein and things like that. Mm. But but the, if, if you then have a look at uh, commercial farming, they will, in order to be resilient from the crises that we're currently facing and will face in the future, perhaps caused by geopolitical issues like, like the Ukraine, where all of a sudden input prices go through the roof. If you're completely reliant on input prices because you've lost those natural processes, you haven't got uh, soil, healthy soil biome or you haven't got pollinators or you, or you haven't got enough um, uh, nutrients in the soil to grow your crops, so you have to buy them all in, mm. then that's a very fragile business model. Increasingly, uh, farming systems which attend to those natural processes, they will be able to uh, show that on the bottom line by being resilient to those spikes in input prices. There'll also be an emerging and is an emerging market in something like carbon sequestration, which mm. their regenerative farming practice, practice will deliver. They'll end up with a stack of revenue streams, which will make the food production resilient and their business resilient to the challenges that we're gonna face in the future. Um, so it's a win, 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 and all the answers live in one place. Right. So in the semiconductor industry, yes. we have the challenges of our science-based target initiatives, particularly scope three, downstream, how does the work of particularly like what Belmont Estates are trying to do with our uh, guests here today, but how does that kind of, how does that help us in the fact of the carbon capture and our science-based target initiatives? Uh, the industry that we work in uh, has had phenomenal benefits for society and uh, some downsides as well. Uh, now, one of those downsides that's been recognised is our emissions and the emissions that are associated with the business that we're in, hence the science-based targets activity. But if you uh, look at the uh, sustainability targets for many industries, it's not just emissions. It's uh, use of water, it's biodiversity, it's impact on society in general. We've obviously made commitments to reduce our emissions in line with one and a half and two degrees C targets like uh, many other companies. Uh, but uh, the industry as a whole could benefit, could benefit society by reduced emissions by about a uh, hundred times what we use every year. Um, but it's, it's all about how do we influence this incredibly complicated system. Uh, we're only one small part. Uh, there's lots of other ways of uh, managing these challenges. I just keep getting this picture from the three of you is there, there's, there's still an awful lot we've got to do. There's still a lot of areas we could do. I still come back to, I'm not saying there's a tension between uh, Henry and you, Gil, and there, but I still like, now you're talking about the peatlands, the dried out peatlands and things like that. The um, It's generally the dried out peatlands from us looking to farm the lands, or is it just because of global warming? What's the reasons the peatlands dried out? And rather than drying them out, is it an advantage of, do we have to wet them again, or can we turn them over to a more um, conservation way of growing more food and maybe looking at other parts of the marine coastland and preserving our agricultural part? I'm just, I just find that tension still about we've got to eat, we don't want to ship because of carbon footprint and politicians tend to see things in black and white as a zero or a one. I still don't get that balance. How do you balance that aspect of feeding and um, and the biodiversity you want to bring back? Because surely that will mean less agricultural land, or does it? Uh, no, not necessarily. So uh, peatland is only one example mm -hmm. of a land use mm -hmm. um, or a land degradation caused by human influence. And it, it might be caused by being drained for agricultural use. 
to take peatland as an example, it was caused by a number of factors. So it's degraded and dried because we drained it to either farm or to graze, mm. or because it's no longer holding water in in the usually in the uplands because those uplands were once forested and they were right. deforested and depopulated for either um, sheep farming or for deer farming predominantly. Mm. But it's it's a pretty useful. Um, uh, example which which could easily be farmland uh, around by us it's lowland so that's um, floodplains that have been drained uh, mm-hmm. and that have been uh, ditched and drained and dredged some will say isn't it some will say levels it's like, like the Netherlands imagine the Netherlands must face a similar challenge as well absolutely it? and and there, there shouldn't, there is a tension, and there is a temptation to be on one side or the other, whether mm. it's food or whether it's climate or whether it's nature. Yeah. But, but that is something we must strive to avoid because mm. the complexity and interconnectedness is how we will, by understanding that, that's how we'll answer these questions. So, uh, we have a rewilding project at Belmont. N- not everyone could or should rewild because you can't rewild your way out of these problems. Mm-hmm. But to rewild a landscape is to understand the natural processes which underpin everything in our in our world from mm. commerce to food production to the provision of medicine to water quality and cleanliness to flood mitigation that really all comes from natural processes so by using something like our rewilding site you can take aspects of it take it back to a conventional or dare i say even an, an intensive farming system and you can underpin it make it resilient make it more productive uh, produce more protein per acre by understanding the natural processes which something like our rewilding project helps to shine a light on Henry, I'm still, you know, we've been talking about here, I'm just thinking about the creation of food in the space, and we've been talking about the peatlands, and we've been talking about, but we are an island, and the food security, and you mentioned that earlier. I'm still I'm still not convinced about this, and Gil said, non-tension, it all works like that. I'm still not convinced. Explain to me why there isn't a tension. So it's it's uh, it's a wonderfully simple answer in the fact that actually without wilding projects, uh, the rates of biodiversity decline in the UK, we simply won't have uh, pollinators for the crops going forward. So it's a really uh, short answer that most people can't quite get their head around and some don't want to accept mm. uh, because bloody uh, large tractors and sprayers and all those sort of things are actually quite a lot of fun um, <laughs> but with without uh, nature we won't have food going forward and I think something that people we're all obsessed with soil and rightly so but we're obsessed with the deterioration of soil that uh, eventually we won't have uh, this sort of the nutrients to, to Uh, or even the topsoil to plant our own crops. And they're sort of saying roughly 40 years. And I think actually biodiversity is a much higher threat than that. It's, we won't have pollinators within probably even 20 or 30 years, which means that we then won't have food like we were all worried about. And we've actually, we've seen uh, the perfect example that the soil uh, on our rewilding project, where we've bought it from a a previous conventional farmer, uh, it's purely a medium. There is no... Uh, life in that soil and we can see that from our pigs the pigs come along uh, and they just ignore this sort of 30 to 40 acre uh, patch of land where it has been uh, conventional wheat for the past 30 years and there is no uh, sign of rootling so showing that there is no life below the topsoil however where there's uh, areas where it's been woodland and there's been uh, pasture for years prior uh, you can see that there's still some life in there so that they're, they're eagerly looking for that and it's it's an interesting. I mean, if you come back away from sort of the vegetable production and you move it back into the uh, the meat sourced proteins, you you can still get um, protein production from these wilding projects with without. Are you um, talking about cows? Yeah, well, cows is a favourite topic on our because we um, we managed to get the fact out is that where the CO two from the CH four comes from in the cows. So I'm glad yeah. you brought up cows again. So <laughs> our, we're hoping our audience still remembers podcast. Two? No idea. We moved it away from cow flatulence to cow chewing. Perfect. So the, <laughs> well, so there's a fun one, which I'm not sure on the numbers of themselves, but uh, statistics uh, are showing that beef that is fed using grass, uh, and that's uh, grass that is growing rather than grass that's been uh, mown for silage or haylage, actually produces a lower methane and carbon production per kilo than uh 
beef that is then grown on or finished on things such as maize and soya. So arguably it is better for the environment, but it also really helps wilding projects and bringing back nature. And it's sort of without having uh, the food or humans in theory being at top of the food chain, you will just get this continuous uh, growth of uh, of animals on the uh, on the ground, which will then eventually lead to uh, this overgrazing. And so we'll actually move back to exactly where we are, where there's no uh, nature there because we've purely just eaten it all. Mm. Um, and so we have to manage that ourselves because we don't have wolves or wildcats in the UK anymore. Uh, we have to manage it ourselves in a responsible way where we can therefore still uh, produce uh, this protein coming off, but also doing it in harmony with nature. Mm. Gil, we talked about peatlands. What other, when we talked about rewilding, what are the kind of, and I'm really interested in the carbon abatement, yeah. but what yeah. kind of, what's the best rewilding? You've got the peatlands wetting. What other, because I read of somewhere in English heritage were going on about on natural, is it England, natural England? Natural England. And they were talking about hedgerows, but that's, that's not rewilding, is it? That's particular... So if we park for a moment the phrase rewilding and we just talk about uh, the restoration of natural processes or ecosystem restoration, uh, and and the short answer to your question, which is the best, is none of them are best, uh, no. or, or each one of them is best in a particular situation. Or How do you know which one? To try and identify which one is best where is to mm. fundamentally misunderstand the complexity right. and the variance of nature. But um, in terms of... Carbon sequestration, drawing down carbon, uh, atmospheric carbon and carbon abatement. There are a number of clearly defined uh, models like uh, like peatland restoration, mm -hmm. which uh, you can uh, quantify through the peatland code. There's sequestration through uh, afforestation and, and tree planting, which uh, can go through the woodland carbon code. And then there's a number of other methodologies which are, which are uh, governing bodies coming through the matrix. So... There's going to be a seagrass one. There's going to be a salt marsh one. There's a biochar one. There's a uh, enhanced weather, weathering one, and the hedgerow uh, carbon mm -hmm. code actually all all coming through. Um, and and so your landscape, your geology, your climate, your particular needs and objectives, whether it's food production or nature production or peculiar and particular mix of the two, will dictate which one of those mechanisms you lean on. Mm -hmm. um, and and the truth is, I. I can't give you an answer as to yeah. which one's best because we've, uh, to take, uh, I nearly said rewilding then, but to take <laughs> ecosystem rest restoration as a model, you try and let the landscape lead. What did you call that again? The ecosystem restoration. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so a farm is still an ecosystem. It's just mm -hmm. a really, really simplified ecosystem. Yeah. It has one or two inputs and one or two outputs. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, and what I think is increasingly trying to be done is to restore those complex ecosystems which which fundamentally undermine our whole um, underpin our whole life. So uh, you look at your site, look at the geology, look at all of the different elements, and you try and let nature lead. Uh, I once asked the uh, owner of Netcastle, Charlie Burrell, when he was really near the beginning of his that's a flagship rewilding project in Sussex, and he was really near the beginning of of rewilding Nep Castle, which is the rewilding project in question. And I naively said, oh, excitedly, what outputs are you hoping for? What are you hoping to see? And he sort of wryly tutted and said, uh, we're not hoping to see anything. We are just interested in recording uh, what happens. Yeah. And so to shift from a results-focused model to a process-focused model mm -hmm. is definitely the point, and it's definitely quite challenging for us to get our, our minds around because we're conditioned to predict results uh, and, in fact, aim for them. Where does our industry play a part in trying to, and I'm going to use the word rewilding, no, <laughs> or, um, what did you call it, Gil? You called it e ecosystem restoration. Yeah. They're all good words. Yeah, I, I yeah. like that one. Expand, because no, what I mean is, where does our industry, where could we help? Uh, well, or how can it help us? Uh, I think we've already uh, been through this a bit, which is essentially, if you don't know what's going on, how can you intervene? You may be intervening in the wrong ways. The system's incredibly complicated. The importance of our industry is to understand where the, the biggest benefits can be derived. And I'll go back to, let's not just talk emissions, let's talk about impact. Our industry does certain things well, it does certain things uh, not so well. Um, so we should be targeting the uh, biggest benefit to society. And part of the, those benefits derive from environmental impact we have, but also on the a general production of food. 
where can the projects that we've been discussing help us? Uh, well, if we can understand better essentially the results of the various systems that are being proposed here, uh, then we can uh, target our efforts rather more on facilitating those, uh, facilitating such projects. It feels to me is that for it all to come together, there has to be a bigger holistic approach involving different parts, whether it's governments, whether it's private initiatives or just, uh, as we come to near the end of the podcast, what kind of what things would you like to see happen to make, you know, from our point of view, the carbon capture, but what kind of things do you see that you would want to see happen moving forward into the future? So I think um, the role of business actually has a really uh, powerful card that it can play, and that, that purely is investment. So if we look at, uh, just take farming for a second, the fact that the return on farming for any organization is actually very, very low. The The idea of profit is a dream. Uh, for anyone who saw uh, Clarkson's farm uh, and at the end of his, his first uh, series, he made something like £42 profit. And from all that the entire work that he put in through the year, it pays nearly That nothing. seems mad, isn't it? Is that you yeah. could be quite a, and it's quite a decent sized farm and make... It was a few hundred acres, yeah. Yeah, and which, make £42 profit just it, seems to be unsustainable and, and, and it is it, it really is unsustainable and the problem is is it, he's very lucky that he can survive off other incomes <clears> um, <throat> but there are other people who it is purely their livelihood and so i'm not saying that businesses or even government should support farming because actually the the system as a whole needs to change people need to pay more for food but the bit that it's and which about, is a bit of a challenge in this kind of day and age isn't it yeah, to pay much. more for food so how do you work that well, it's a very touchy you, subject, yeah. but the bit that it will slowly come round to is is the nature restoration, and it's 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 actually education. So mm. it's getting uh, our generation and generations above and below to realise that nature can play a part in everything from food production to mental uh, health, and also to the environmental solutions that we so desperately need. And the problem is, is that farmers who are in the position to be able to deliver this don't have the money to invest. Yeah. There are companies who, in theory, have profits who can invest into this and make a difference. And the, the bit that uh, we do at this state that we're actually very proud of is we, uh, last year we educated 3,000 children free of charge. Mm -hmm. This year we're on target to educate 4,500 children free of charge. And that's uh, taking uh, children from surrounding areas and immersing them in nature to actually allow them to see what the natural environment looks like mm -hmm. and why this is important without financial contribution there are farms and estates that simply can't afford to do this yeah. and so we are continuing down this problem where no one will actually value the natural environment mm. because it's easier to play on a, uh, a games console and yeah. eat cheap food and so we need people to wake up and learn about yeah. what dangers we're heading for Gil what do you see the future or what would you like to see uh, so traditionally Governments move a little bit more slowly than um, than business, uh, and and businesses will move, driven perhaps by bottom line, as as has mm -hmm. to be the case. Otherwise, nothing is very sustainable. So, uh, w I think what we all want is a transparent, uh, reasonably easy to understand, trustworthy, incredible carbon market. Mm -hmm. And what I would particularly like is for that carbon market to acknowledge those other complexities, from community to nature. Uh, to food production, because my fear is that what we have at the moment runs the risk of being a little binary. Yeah, I know. What you mean, uh, yeah. And so, adding that complexity, although it's tremendously inconvenient, because because uh, it's really nice to understand that if you plant a tree, uh, it will sequester X amount of carbon in its lifetime. You can put that into a spreadsheet. There is more complexity to acknowledge. So, uh, as this market evolves, we've got to bring in those factors of community, that, that nature mm -hmm. connection that Henry was talking about that we're so passionate about at Belmont, nature and food. And then we'll end up with something which is hopefully elegant, but complex enough to meet the, the needs that we currently face. Thanks, gentlemen. I think for me, that's been really enlightening. And, you know, Chris and I have been talking about capturing carbon all this time, but you've given us a really insight into the complexity and I well actually I don't think it's complex it seems really simple you put it out in a simple way that everyone should start to look to contribute um thank you for coming along today it's been really interesting yeah thank you thank you very much thank, thank you for you. inviting us